Welcome to the Law School Toolbox Podcast and to a whole new year. Today, we're talking about taking stock, regrouping, and a few resolutions you might want to consider for the new school year. Your Law School Toolbox hosts are Allison Monahan, that's me, and Lee Burgess. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience so you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. We're the co creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the career related website, Career Dicta. I also run the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review on iTunes. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we would love to hear from you. With that, let's get started. Welcome back. Today we're talking about taking stock, regrouping, and a few resolutions you might want to consider for this new year. So January can be a rough time in law school. The weather is terrible lots of places, the holiday break is over, and of course, grades are coming in. So Allison, should we start by talking Uh, about grades? I know, everybody wants to talk about grades. (laughs) Let's talk about grades. Well, first off, how important are your law school grades, specifically in your first year? Well, I mean, let's be honest, they don't not matter. I mean, they do matter, but they don't tell you everything. Um, Because, you know, we talk a lot on this podcast and we talk a lot on our blog about how law school is a learned skill. So oftentimes your first semester grades are a starting point and you can learn a lot of valuable lessons and kind of jump off from those to do a lot better in your second semester. Yeah, I think that's right. I think it's a balance. You know, if you get consistently poor grades, you probably want to take that seriously. But at the same time, I think a lot of people, probably most people in law school, are likely to be seeing grades they've never seen before in their life. (laughs) You know, just because basically you're on a curve now. And most people, unless you are a hard science major, you really haven't had that experience of a lot of smart people all competing for just a few top grades. That's true. You do have to take a breath and realize there are only a handfuls of A's and A minuses and B pluses in your class, and um, you know those are pretty hard to get <laughs> in the law school. Uh, yeah, the law school situation. Yeah, I mean, depending on what the curve is at your school, even a grade of you know a C plus might be above the curve. I mean, that would be a pretty harsh curve, but it's not unheard of. Yeah, and then there are of course the schools who do the high pass and pass or um, just pass fail. I mean, we are seeing more and more schools kind of abandoning first year grades too. Well, they're not really abandoning them. I mean, there's still a hierarchy there. It's just a more compressed hierarchy. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you know, if you get a pass and you're thinking, why didn't I get a high pass? It's really not that different from getting a B plus and thinking you should have gotten an A. That's true. Um, you know, I mean, I think most people are going to be evaluated in some way and that can often be demoralizing. But like you said, this doesn't tell you everything. Um, And you can obviously still be a very successful attorney. If you are disappointed with your first semester grades, they're not telling you which class you enjoyed. They don't tell you what class you learned the most in. They don't tell you which professor you liked. I mean, they're a little bit random, to be honest. It really can be. And if you got a bad grade in a class and you were planning to, you know, practice that type of law for a living. So you were going to be a prosecutor and you bombed your crim law final. It would not change your professional plans just because you didn't execute your exam in the way that you had hoped. It's a little more complicated than that. There are a lot of reasons why um, an, an exam may not go well. And it doesn't mean that you should you know, abandon all of your plans or just because you rocked civil procedure that you now need to go be a civil litigator. Right, exactly. I mean, A lot can happen in those three to four hours in the exam room. Maybe you didn't sleep well. Maybe you weren't feeling well. Maybe for whatever reason, you were just totally on it and you were going with the flow and you happened to write exactly what your professor was looking for. But you can't overestimate the importance of these grades. I mean, yes, they're important. They may have some impact on your future hiring or hireability, but one grade is not enough to make you completely change your life course. I think that would just be silly. Yeah. I mean, if you consistently didn't pass any of your classes. That's, I think, a different discussion. <laughs> that you know? is a different story. Yeah. And I knew people in law school who were really unsuccessful after that first semester, and they took some time to reevaluate whether law school was a good fit for them. And I think that that can be a valuable discussion to have with yourself or with trusted advisors. Because, um, you know, although 
you can come back from disappointing grades in law school, and I've seen many, many people do that. If you thought you were excelling and you didn't excel at all, you should at least ask yourself that question. Right. I mean, to a certain extent, these grades are giving you valuable information and you should listen to them. I mm-hmm. mean, if that information is basically you are not being successful as a law student, that may be painful, but it's also something to think about because you don't want to struggle through the next two and a half years and then struggle through the bar exam and then struggle through the profession if maybe this is just not the greatest fit for your abilities and your interests and your skills. There's nothing wrong with having that conversation. Yeah. And, you know, if you got one bad grade, um, you know, maybe it's a good idea to just keep that in perspective. It could be the one bad grade because that was just a class that you struggled in or that you and the professor's um, thought processes don't really jive. You know, sometimes you'll find different professors. You just might have a hard time communicating in the way that they want you to communicate. I mean, that totally happens. Or you might find professors that you get exactly how they want you to communicate and then you high score their classes. <laughs> so it's, yeah, exactly. Um, but And you should take more classes with those professors. Yes, yes, you should. But, um, you know, don't get completely demoralized if there's just one grade. You still have things to learn from that grade. Um, but just realize that maybe that was an outlier. Learn the lessons you can and then just regroup and replan for your next semester. Yeah, absolutely. I think learn what you can from these grades, take them seriously, but not too seriously. How about the opposite? How about if somebody did really well? Can they just slack off and assume that they're a law school genius? I think that's a poor idea because oftentimes some of those people at the top of the class end up not being at the top of the class anymore after that first semester (laughs) because they do get a little too comfortable. And when you think about the curve, everyone who, you know, was kind of knocking at the door of those high scores, but didn't, you know, really get them is going to typically you know, talk to their professors, get more feedback, study a little bit harder, study smarter, um, work with a tutor, whatever they need to do to all of a sudden be much better law students. You also need to continue to be a better law student if you want to stay ahead of that group that's going to be knocking on the door of those B pluses and A's. For sure. I think also there can just be some reversion to the mean. You know, maybe you actually did just get kind of lucky on two of your grades <laughs> out of three or something. And, you know, you were right at the borderline between a B plus and an A minus, And the professor, for whatever reason, gave you the A minus. That doesn't mean that you were you know, massive points ahead of the person who got the B plus. It just means on that particular day when the professor was grading that particular set of exams, you were slightly higher. So I think that's worth keeping in mind. I mean, I certainly did a lot better first semester than I did second semester. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I think that happens a lot. Yeah, I did too, because I got better at being a law student. (laughs) So, I mean, I was much better. I was a much better law student second semester than I was. Well, I'm saying I was the opposite. Oh, you were the opposite. First semester. Yeah. And then basically had a breakdown second semester and like barely even took my exams. And so shockingly enough, didn't do so well. (laughs) So. Yeah, I think, again, like you've just got to keep all these things in perspective. Just because you did well doesn't mean that you're going to be, you know, the very top of your class when you graduate as a 3L unless you continue making some effort. If you did do super well, though, Allison, don't you think it's okay to start entertaining things like if you want to transfer, if that's something that you're interested in? I mean, these first semester grades can give you an inkling on whether or not that's going to be a possibility. Sure, but I think that's also a way to create a lot more pressure for yourself. Mm -hmm. And then that pressure can become overwhelming. I mean, that was basically what happened to me is I said, well, I did so well the first semester, I'm required to keep doing well, which means I have to study even more, you know, and rapidly basically burned out and was depressed and, you know, it wasn't a good scene. So, yeah, I think you can think about those things and you can think, okay, this might be realistic for me. But I think you also have kind kind of have to put that aside a little bit and say, well, you know, I did great. That's awesome. This might be realistic for me. It's something that I do want to keep in mind, but I'm going to kind of put that off to the side and focus on what I'm doing on a daily basis to ensure that, you know, I end the second semester doing as well as I did. Yeah, that's a good point. We do have a really interesting podcast on transferring that we'll link to in the show notes if that's something you are chewing on um, as a possibility. I think there's some good information there that you can collect. And then, like Allison said, put it to the side so you can still kick ass <laughs> for the rest of the semester, to, yeah. you know, I mean, um, yeah, without you, yeah, distracting you have to keep yourself. doing well, basically. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> this does feed into one of the things that we would suggest you do in these first weeks of the semester, which is go talk to your professors. Whether mm-hmm. you did well, whether you did poorly, just go talk to them. Yeah. 
Remember, professors typically like students. That's why they became law professors. <laughs> so you should go talk to them. <laughs> exactly. Right. Because if, even if you did well, you might end up wanting a recommendation. So you may as well go and chat them up when they're still kind of remembering like, oh, Lee was that person who got the A on the exam. And Lee shows up and says, hey, you know, I just want to let you know I really enjoyed the class possibly thinking about maybe transferring in the future. So just putting that out there, you know, do you have any advice? And they'll probably be happy to talk to you. Yeah. Also, it can be good to meet with those professors because you oftentimes will take some of these 1L professors again in your 2L Mm -hmm. and 3L year, especially if it's an area of the law that's of interest to you. And so keeping on their radar can make those Um, seminar classes or upper division classes more enjoyable if they already have a favorable opinion of you going into another semester. Right. Right. But if you weren't pleased with your exams, we especially recommend that you go talk to your professors because here you're trying to get advice on how to do better. So Lee, how can people talk to their professors about their exams and make it productive? Well, first they need to take a deep breath and just do it because I think that you know, getting people to go to these meetings, which can be very challenging to go to, is is something that we're very passionate about. But it does take a lot of, I guess, what, self-motivation <laughs> to go to these kind of meetings that can be tough. Emotional likes, maturity. Yes, emotional maturity, because nobody likes getting, you know, negative feedback if that's what's coming at you, um, even if it's constructive. So you take a deep breath and go ahead and just do this. You're going to be happy you did. And when you get there, you want to think about a few things. You really want to ask for specifics on your exam. So it's possible you've been able to get a copy of your exam from the registrar. It's possible that the professor may have a copy that you can review in those office hours. Professors have all sorts of different rules about how they release exam answers. Uh, But likely you're going to have some sort of exam answer in your lap while you're talking to the professor. And you want to try and get specifics. So if the professor says you were being too conclusory, so you didn't get enough points, try and get them to point out somewhere on the paper where you were too conclusory and walk you through it. Ask for an example of what you could have done better. Um, You know, try and get those specifics and maybe even take notes while you're in there. Because since you might be nervous, I think a lot of people are kind of a little anxious in these meetings. It can be hard to even remember a lot of the things that your professor is saying. So if you have a notepad with you, it might make sense to like take some of those notes so you can refresh your recollection outside of the meeting. Um, or if you're going to academic support or your tutor and sharing that feedback, you want to be able to say, like, this is what the professor actually said. Um, and, you know, listen to what they tell you. If you go to four different professors and every professor tells you that, that you need to work on structure or analysis or organization or time management, that's important information that across the board feedback is going to really help you focus what are the top things you need to work on this time around. Um, Other things that professors can be very helpful with, I know professors who have been able to alert students that they may have a learning disability um, and they may need to go get tested Mm -hmm. for a learning difference. That can be very powerful information. You know, I think it can be, again, challenging sometimes to get that feedback, But a lot of times students are diagnosed with things in law school that they weren't diagnosed with before because law school is kind of this weird pressure cooker (laughs) that brings out all of our personality traits to like the nth degree, I think. Um, (laughs) And and it really challenges you in a way that a lot of folks, um, you know, haven't necessarily been challenged. But professors can kind of suss this out. They have a lot of experience. And if they're offering you resources from your school, um, you want to be able to access those resources. That's a great point. I mean, every school should have some sort of office of disability services type of position. And if you are getting feedback from your professors, like, hey, you know, it's really, I find I was surprised about your grade. It seemed like you were really engaged in class. Do you think there could be something going on here? Um, I think that's worth checking out Mm -hmm. because these are people who have seen a lot of things before and they've seen some of these patterns Um, you know, for students particularly that are surprising Um, in the questions, you know, what's the cause of that surprise? Like, do you have some sort of learning disability that needs to be accommodated? Do, were you just not studying correctly? Did you misunderstand what was going to be on the exam? You know, did something happen in your personal life? What we're trying to do at this point is really diagnose the problem, whatever the problem is. And so if all of your professors are saying the same thing, I think that's a pretty clear sign that 
that is a direction that you could go towards diagnosing and fixing whatever that issue is. And I think some students might worry that talking to your professor about either learning differences or weaknesses on an exam is is going to make you seem less impressive or that is going to do bad things to your professional reputation. Professors respect you coming and trying to be better at this craft. So I wouldn't worry about that type of stuff. I think professors respect someone who says, I want to be my best self. I want to be the best lawyer I can be. Can you? How can you help me get there? Um, they're not going to look bad on you. <laughs> that's, that's not going to negatively reflect on you um, because you're trying to be your best self, your best law student. Right. They're going to see that you have a growth mentality. And I think that's the way to approach these meetings is make clear, like, look, I'm not asking you for a different grade. I'm not challenging my grade. I just want to understand how I can improve in the future. Because the other thing to remember, you're going to see a lot of these first year classes again yep. when you take the bar exam. So you can't just blow them off and be like, oh, God, Civ Pro, like, I never want to think about that again. Because guess what? <laughs> you're going to have to think about it again. Yeah, <laughs> you know? it's so, so true. Predict. Particularly if you had substantive issues, you know, of knowing the law, that's something to really take seriously because you can't just forget about these things. Yeah. Or struggle with certain different types of an exam. So for instance, if you found that consistently you struggled with multiple choice questions, if you had multiple classes with multiple choice questions, that's very important information to have because half of basically everyone's bar exam is multiple choice questions. So, you know. Yep, great point. You know, that means that maybe you need to study multiple choice questions differently or um, get more practice or go to academic support or, you know, you start to see the handwriting on the wall in the future. When I do intake calls with folks who have failed the bar exam, one of my first bundle of questions is, did you struggle on exams in the beginning of your law school career? (laughs) Because it really is an indicator. And the answer typically is Is, going to be yes. Yes, it is. Um, Oftentimes the answer is yes. I was able, my grades went up as I took less of those doctrinal classes. And so you can't right. ignore them. It's going to come back and haunt you in the end. Yeah, you might be able to get your grades up in later years by just taking paper classes, but mm-hmm. you do have to wonder if that's really helping you develop the skills that you need to be able to pass the bar exam, which is, of course, a requirement for becoming an actual lawyer. And that's you're in Wisconsin. And then if you go to the University of Wisconsin, you can just go into the bar. Little known fact. Congratulations to those people. <laughs> yeah, but not too many of not too many of our listeners are probably in that situation, but we all do envy them. Yes. All right. Well, what if you find out that you really need more help? You could leave these meetings scratching your head, um, saying, "Now I have a list of feedback. Now what do I do with it?" Well, I think the first thing people can do is really look to the resources that your school is providing, because oftentimes they're providing a lot of resources, and you're already paying for those things. So you may as well look into them and see if you think they could be useful. For example, a number of schools have peer tutors where two L's or three L's who did really well in a class can actually help you. That could be useful. Um, Academic support is another great option. They're trained to help you figure out what's going on and help you improve it. I mean, depending on how poorly you did, you may be required to interact with them. Mm -hmm. But in a lot of schools, it would be optional, but it's definitely worth going to. And then I think something that's often overlooked is a lot of campuses have some sort of writing center, particularly if there's a big undergraduate university attached. And oftentimes you can go to that writing center and get help on your writing, which is an issue for a lot of law students. You know, if you're consistently not doing particularly well on your essay exams, it's probably not just because you don't understand the law. There's probably something going on with the structure or the way that you're writing. And these people can really help with that. And it's also can be outside of the law school a little bit. So I think sometimes people feel a little more comfortable, you know, getting a critique of something that you've written, that maybe you've already turned in, and just seeing, you know, what they have to say about how you could be a better writer. Yeah, that's a really interesting idea. If you had, like, your legal research and writing final from first semester that you weren't happy with, it would be interesting to take it to a writing center and get some feedback on it um, before you dive into your second semester. Yeah, and obviously you probably can't you know, get help on things you haven't gotten a grade on. Right. You know? <laughs> but if it's something that you've already turned in and you've already been evaluated on, they may have some other ideas or just see things that maybe your legal writing instructor doesn't have time to talk about or won't talk to you about or whatever it is. There's really no harm in just getting a second opinion. Yep, I think that's a really, really good point. 
And then, of course, tutoring um, with companies or organizations like ours um, that can kind of help you customize a plan of attack for you based on what you struggled with and and help you in this diagnosis process. Um, And we are also able to kind of suss out from the professor feedback that you're going to collect, you know, what we think is going on. Sometimes professors can be a little cryptic. So one of the things we can do is say, okay, well, if you heard this from three professors, this is probably what it means. (laughs) because Right. Or like, hey, they didn't actually say this, but we're going to tell you what they really were saying here. Right. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And then Allison, we have something. They were being polite. Right. Uh, We have something called the Reboot Course. You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, the Reboot Course is basically designed to help you figure out what happened first semester and then give you the skills or help you develop the skills that you need to turn it around. So Mm -hmm. you'll work with one of our tutors to really go through this process, which can be a little intimidating, I think, to do on your own. It can be a little bit emotionally draining. Maybe you have a little fear around some of this stuff. So it's almost like having a coach, really, who can help you you know, figure out how to approach your professor, what they're telling you, and then you can develop some skills, do some exercises, and hopefully have a more productive and successful second semester. Yeah. I think another thing students need to do is evaluate you know, the activities they did that they considered studying and make sure that they actually helped. One of these right. <laughs> always to start with is your study group. And did the study uh, group... your study group. The study group. Did it actually help? Um, or... Would you rather work with different people? Would you rather work alone? Would you rather change the structure? I think um, it's just good to really think through about whether or not that was the best use of your time. Um, And if you didn't study with a study group or partner, you might consider wanting to do that or wanting to do that later in the semester to help facilitate practice exams or things like that. So it's good to just spend some time kind of making pros and cons lists or just thinking through kind of how you studied and um, and what added value and what didn't. Because I think one of the things that can be so hard in your early part of your legal education is to really decide what activities added value. Because there's tons of work to be done. There's never any shortage of work. Mm -hmm. But what if that work actually added value? So did reading supplements add value? Did spending time with your study group add value? Did making flashcards add value? Did recopying someone else's outline add value? That's really what you want to start thinking about because the task that didn't actually get you towards your goal should be cut or altered. And that's going to free up more time for you to do the task that actually got you where you needed to be. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing that can be kind of interesting if you were in a study group is how did you do in comparison to the other members of the group? Mm -hmm. And that might be demoralizing because sometimes you found out that, well, actually, you know, I did the worst by far. Mm -hmm. But I think you have to look at why that is, particularly if you felt like you were doing okay. You know, maybe it was the case that you were really relying on your group knowledge rather than your individual knowledge and you need to spend a little bit more time by yourself, you know, making sure you understand these things. Or maybe there's something about the way that you're writing you know, you've got to figure out like, okay, what is it? If we all studied together and then I got, you know, much poorer grades, why did that happen? Um, Yeah. I mean, I'll be honest. I had a study group for my property class um, my second semester. And there was one guy who pretty much taught me all of like future interests and things like that um, because he just understood it a lot better than I did. But I got an A in the class and he did not. And what was interesting, well, because we sat down and talked about it because we were good friends. And it was basically because after we all kind of got this global understanding, I went and like memorized stuff. <laughs> like I went and memorized <laughs> all those formulas. I did all the practice tests. I worked on speed and precision and things like that. And that wasn't really what he focused on. And so it was a really great example of the study group and kind of the learning and the conceptual understanding of some of these classes is not the same as the execution of the exam. Right. And I think that's, you know, probably why you did pretty well in law school is you focused on the exam and other people maybe focus more on having a broader understanding of the law, which frankly might serve them well in practice, but maybe not so well on the actual exam if it's a closed book exam. Yeah. All right. So what about other ways people are struggling? Because as you mentioned, you found there were all sorts of new struggle, personal struggles in the second semester. Um, so if people just find that they're overwhelmed and they're not doing well, what should they do? Well, I think, again, like you've got to kind of evaluate what the situation is and then ask for help. I mean, for me, 
it became apparent a few months or a few weeks into the semester, like I was basically not really getting out of bed. I wasn't really going to class. You know, I wasn't really eating. At some point you kind of think, huh, maybe this is not something that is really great and not something that I need to struggle through on my own. And so I went to the student health services and basically started therapy and it was fantastic. Um, And it really did help. I mean, you know, by the end of the semester, basically my therapist has sort of pulled me together enough to at least go take my exams, um, even if I didn't ace them. But, you know, I think there's no, there's no shame and there's no harm in thinking about whether that would be productive for you. And your school probably provides a lot of these resources for free or meaning you're already paying for them. Right. So you may as well, <laughs> may as well at least consider, you know, would it be helpful for you to have someone to talk to? And you don't have to be you know, clinically depressed to go to a therapist. You just might want someone to talk to confidentially about your day-to-day struggles in law school, or, you know, it's not like what you thought it was going to be and you're not sure what to do with your career path. These are all very valid things to go talk to someone about who's trained to help you. Absolutely. And I think another thing to consider is if you're struggling with life realities outside of law school, maybe you're in a tumultuous romantic relationship or... Oh, yeah, um, so I broke up with my boyfriend. Yeah. That. <laughs> so, you know, that can really be something that you need help working through or um, you've had a family situation or there's an illness in your family that's creating a lot of stress. Um, or you had a loss of a pet or whatever it might be that is weighing on you that will show up in law school. These Some of these school resources can also be used to help you walk through that because life is hard. And I was actually just at brunch yesterday with a friend and we were talking about how as we get older, we continue to appreciate that life is just such a mixed bag. Like things are never all good or all bad, it seems. It's it's like good and bad things are always constantly happening together, right? <laughs> yeah. you know, and so you're celebrating one person's success while you're mourning something else really challenging or somebody's suffering while somebody else is um, celebrating. And and it can be complicated to uh, work through a lot of that stuff. So if you have hard stuff going on in your life, you should go ask for help because it's not going to get easier when crunch time comes and your anxiety gets raised and maybe you're not sleeping as much for you to be able to process all of that stuff. For sure. And I think, you know, a lot of the stuff you're going to learn if you reach out to someone like this who is trained to help you in these sort of situations is really coping skills that you can use for the rest of your career. Mm -hmm. And lawyers in general don't have great coping skills. It tends to be alcohol and drugs, um, which is why there's such a substance abuse problem in the profession. But law school is a great time to start working on these things and developing these healthier ways to deal with the inevitable stresses that come with life. And certainly they come with life as if you're going to be an attorney, it's a very stressful profession. Mm -hmm. The other thing you can consider is trying to do some stuff outside of law school, um, which will help your mental health. So exercise is always a big one, but this doesn't mean, you know, seven days of monotony at the gym. <laughs> you know, it can right. Be, it can be something fun. So um, sometimes your school or university might even have like classes, you know, um, some people um, can take belly dancing or boxing or yoga or um, you know, hip hop dance. I mean, you name it, like a lot of school health centers um, have a lot of different options for stuff like that. And it can be a really nice break. Um, Sometimes being in a room full of people who aren't in law school, like listening to loud music and bouncing around can be very therapeutic. <laughs> yeah, I took lots of great gym classes. I took, I actually did take belly dancing. It was amazing. I had the greatest abs I've ever had in my life. Um, <laughs> I also took squash, which unfortunately a lot of people signed up for who were law students. But, you know, it's a good New York winter sport. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think thinking about ways to make getting exercise and being healthy particularly during the winter, entertaining and fun, whether it's social, you know, do you want to train for something? Maybe you want to do something like team and training where you Mm -hmm. have a group of people that you go suffer through your runs with, but they become your friends, you know, and it's a social outlet. Yeah. And if you don't want to do any of that, even just scheduling exercise can help because then at least, you know, you've committed to it, you're going to do it. But I think if you can find something you truly enjoy, it can be a great way to relieve stress and just kind of get out of the headspace of the pressure feel pressure filled, you know, cauldron that law school is. I think that's true. And a lot of times students feel like they can't take advantage of this stuff because of the cost. Um, but if right. there's something you're really passionate about, um, it's worth just calling around and asking because oftentimes places have student discounts. 
Um, I know we have some friends that, um, who's actually a lawyer who she and her husband own a CrossFit gym in San Francisco, and they always have student rates um, mm-hmm. because they appreciate how important it is <laughs> for students to be you know, able to have their physical outlets. So I think a lot of people wouldn't know that. They would just assume that it's cost prohibitive, but you should just ask questions because a lot of times people want to help students because we were all students once um, and they know how important it's going to be. Right. Particularly if you're a lawyer. I mean, at some point you're probably going to have money, so they yeah. don't mind giving you a break. Um, yeah, somebody even did a blog where she went around to all the gyms in New York City and got the two-week free trial and just did that and blogged about it for a year or something. So, I mean, that costs nothing. Yeah, that's a good point. A lot of yoga studios will do introductory packages. Um, one thing that I know is mm-hmm. popular um, in San Francisco is a lot of um, like yoga studios or um, different sort of bar workout places. It seems like there are studios for everything these days, but we'll do cleaning exchanges. So if you do an hour Mm -hmm. of work around the gym a week, you can basically get almost like very, very low cost or almost free exercise services. So for one hour a week, it can be worth it if that's something you're passionate about. But you got to ask if these things exist. (laughs) So that's, so you just have to be willing to go ask these questions because I didn't even know um, that folks were able to do that. And a lot of uh, people I know do that at yoga studios and then they're able to get like yoga for the month for like $30 or something like that because they are able to do this work exchange. Yeah. Yeah, no, that sounds great. Um, I think the only, another thing people probably want to be thinking about is what about your social life? Mm. You know, <laughs> is yeah. it just totally dead? If so, you know, social, social isolation is not a great place to be. So it's really important, even if it seems hard, to make time for friends, whether those are old friends or new friends, your loved ones. You know, you've got to kind of think, what do you enjoy doing? Who do you enjoy hanging out with? And how can you make that happen in a way that doesn't just fall by the wayside as soon as you start going to the library? It's true. And sometimes this takes scheduling. I mean, I know we feel like we're just telling everybody to schedule, schedule, schedule. But as we get busier, I mean, I have to schedule. I have these girlfriends and we do these kind of um, dinners out as a group a few times a year. We have to schedule them like six weeks ahead of time sometimes to make sure we all get on our calendars because people get really busy and everybody has different jobs and travels for work and stuff like that. So sometimes you have to be thinking ahead. But if that's something you really enjoy, and you get something out of seeing some of those friends, then it's worth it to just do a little bit of planning and stick it on your calendar and then build your study schedule around um, fun activities like that. Yeah, for sure. And even people who are introverts, who think of themselves as introverts, there actually is a lot of data showing that they're happier when they spend time with other people too. So Mm. even if you think, no, I don't need anyone, I'll just spend all my life in the library, you're probably going to be happier if you go out once a week with your friends and, you know, catch up. Yeah. That being said, I think... One of the big catch-ups at a lot of law schools is something like bar review. I think you do have to be careful about your drinking. Yeah. Um, as we mentioned earlier, substance abuse, big issue in the legal profession. I'm not saying, you know, you have to stop drinking, although a lot of people take the beginning of the year as maybe a time to try a dry month. Just see how that goes. Reset. <laughs> um, you know, I have a lot of friends who do that. And they find it helpful just to sort of see like, okay, how hard is this for me? If it's really hard, maybe this is something I need to, you know, really pay close attention to. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, I think it can be tempting to just fall into your whole social outlet being Thursday night bar review and you go out and you get completely hammered and then that gives you the excuse to be hungover all day Friday. And that's just not a pattern that you necessarily want to be repeating for every week of the next semester. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I have another friend who does... um, weekly movie nights with a group of friends and they um sometimes they go out to a movie sometimes they go to somebody's house and watch a movie but it's just kind of a standing date and of course if something comes up one person might not be there but i thought that was kind of a fun idea um that that you that would work really well in a school context if you just kind of had this standing hey, sure you know like group this group of friends will watch a netflix movie every tuesday night or whatever night you pick it is and then um you can come or not go that's just an easy way to create new habits to be more social. Yeah, and I think something like that, that you know you're going to do, again, like you can plan around it like, oh, every Tuesday night is my movie night, so I'm not going to plan to study late that night. Mm -hmm. And that's a great opportunity to take a break. Yeah. What about spring break? I know that means a lot more to people who went to school in 
cold places. <laughs> so. Oh my gosh. But yeah, like my first, my spring break in law school, my first year we went to Florida because after like the worst winter ever in New York City, we were just dying. I mean, we, you just had to go. Even if, you know, exams were coming up and whatever, you just had to go to the sun for a few days. Yeah. And I think that's completely legitimate and totally worth thinking about because by the time March gets there, if you are in a cold, snowy environment, you are probably going to be going crazy. Yeah, I think it's a really good idea. So think ahead, start saving money now <laughs> to, uh, to try and make something happen. Exactly. Yeah, so, you know... Luckily, it's not quite as bad as Thanksgiving in terms of timing, usually, so it's a little bit earlier. But I think, you know, thinking about can you give yourself a break Mm -hmm. is going to be helpful. Yeah. I mean, basically, like, these first weeks are really a time for you to evaluate what worked and what didn't work, and then kind of predict what's not going to be working in a few months, and then figure out a new approach where necessary. Yeah. So since it's New Year's resolution time even though they oftentimes fail, but that's a whole different conversation. (laughs) There are a few New Year's resolutions that you might consider that um, I think are reasonable to incorporate into your life. So uh, the first one is go to each professor's office hours twice a month, um, at least, and, you know, bring questions, um, bring hypos, you know, engage with your professors. Um, And then schedule and honor a day off each week so you can do something that doesn't include sitting in the library and looking at your computer. Um, If you are not in a freezing cold place, I think hiking and doing stuff like that is a great thing to do on those days off. Um, But whatever you do, don't do it on the computer. Um, no, if you are in a cold place like New York, for example, go to a museum. Mm, you know, it's basically idea. like indoor hiking. It gives you yeah. something something cool to look at. In fact, you often get in free with your student ID, so there's no excuse. I mean, you know, you have amazing cultural resources. Mm-hmm. Just go and wander through them for a few hours. It can be really fantastic. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Um, you should try and exercise. I mean, let's take reasonable goals: forty five minutes, three times a week. Um, it's a great study break. I think that's good. I mean, an yeah. hour seems like a lot. You know, exactly. 45 minutes, that's nothing. You can do 45 minutes. Yeah, if you do 45 minutes, it's only like an hour and 15 if you consider like getting to the gym, doing 45 minutes, getting cleaned up and leaving. Like you can find that. That's a long lunch break. Um, yeah, exactly. I've been doing this like 40-minute hit workout where it's like intense training for 40 minutes. And it's awesome because I go and 40 minutes later, I'm like, wow, that was a lot of exercise. I am done. <laughs> <laughs> Um, setting up friend dates every week to relax. So so our movie night idea is one of them. Um, but just, you know, whether it's law school friends or non-law school friends, um, putting something on your calendar so you can do something fun and connect with people is very important. Um, and then something we've also talked about a lot on the podcast is the idea of deep work. Um, so try and schedule and put on your study Mm. calendar at least three hours of deep, deep work each week. Uh, for putting the material together, practicing, starting to outline and things like that. You got to stick that on your study schedule. Yeah, absolutely. If that's not on your schedule, it's not going to happen. So just go ahead and block out three or four hours on a Saturday, on a Sunday, maybe on a Friday if you don't have class and just put it on there. You're much more likely to do it. And that's really going to help you get ahead this semester and correct these things that may have caused problems for you in the first semester. Yeah. Um, Other things I would suggest, I think making a plan for when you're going to go to sleep and actually sticking to it to Mm. the extent you can, you know, whether it's 10 PM, 11 PM, 12 PM, one, it doesn't really matter. But, you know, thinking about when am I going to sleep? How much am I going to sleep? Okay. What do I need to do to make that happen? Absolutely critical. Sleep is absolutely critical for memory. It's critical for learning. And if you're not sleeping, you're probably not going to be doing that well. Yeah. That's a really good point. Um, Food is something you probably want to think about too. Um, maybe making a weekly meal plan and eating home cooked food, maybe even on your days off, trying to do some cooking ahead, um, which can, which a lot of meal planners recommend, um, doing some big cooking on the weekends to give you food for the week. Yep. I'm a huge fan now of the Instant Pot. Might be a great, you know, thing to ask for if you have a holiday coming up or a birthday, Mostly because you can just put stuff in it, push a button, and you walk away, and then you come back, and your food is ready, and you yeah. can just eat it, and it's amazing. Yep. Yeah, the Instapot, a slow cooker. Um, I'm into, like, large pots of 
mashed sweet potatoes. I make mashed cauliflower, uh, things that you can make that really aren't any more work to make a large volume of (laughs) that you can eat like the entire week um, is pretty great can pressure steam all those in the Instagram, in the Instapot. Oh. Apparently, I haven't tried it yet. I have one I'm getting ready to try, but I have a sweet potato, and apparently you can steam it under pressure for like two minutes, and it cooks through, which I don't believe, but this is what I... Like I'm a doing. whole sweet potato? Yes, a whole sweet potato. Huh, that's really crazy, because... I'll let I you know how it goes. Like, if you're going to... When I do the mashed sweet potatoes, I like cut them up into cubes, and you have to boil them for like 30 minutes to get them soft enough. Yeah, I'm telling you, the Instapot is like, it's life changing. Oh my gosh. Now you're going to like get me on the Instapot like bandwagon. Because <laughs> like I, in all my mom groups, like online, everybody raves about it. But I have, I have so far just been like old. It's school. so fast. Okay. All right. No, Let's it's know. so fast. It's really, I mean, I think for law student life, like it's actually truly amazing. Um, I mean, making stuff like grains and things like that, it's just, it makes it so incredibly easy that you have basically no excuse not to do it. So you can do rice and all of that stuff in it. I feel like we should get like a kickback oh, for yeah. Instapot right now. We should. No, I do like brown rice. Brown rice, you just push a button and like, you know, you come back and it's not even that. I mean, it's quick. So in 30 minutes or whatever it is, it's finished and it's perfect. Wow. Okay. That's pretty cool. Maybe I need to update my, yeah, my holiday highly recommend list. It. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. And then the other thing I think you should do is probably spend a couple of hours a week actually applying for summer jobs if you don't have a summer job yet. Yes, that is a good point. But controlling that so it doesn't take over your life and keep you from studying for your classes. No, I think exactly. Like set up a sort of like your deep work, you know, put two hours a week that you're going to actually apply for jobs on your calendar and then do it. Perfect. All right. Well, that's a long list of things to do, but we think you can do it. It's good (laughs) to do goal setting in the new year is a great time to um, set these intentions. And you know, just um, remember that all of this stuff is just going to help you um, be the best law student you can be, uh, which, you know, leads to all sorts of good stuff. So, yeah, I mean, the reality is you control your time, you control where you focus your energy, even if it seems like school is making you do things, you really have control over your own time. And you want to use that time well, so that you set yourself up for a productive and even, dare we say, enjoyable spring semester. Ooh. But with that, we're out of time. But before we finish up, we wanted to take a second to let you know about our 1L Reboot course at our website, lawschooltoolbox.com. You just click on the courses link. This on-demand course, which includes feedback from one of our awesome Law School Toolbox tutors, will help you get productive feedback from your professors and figure out why your grades aren't what you hoped for and help you position yourself for success in the future. So check it out and feel free to contact us if you have any questions. If you enjoyed this totally episode, yes. <laughs> if you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review and rating on iTunes. We'd really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to Lee or Allison at Lee at Law School Toolbox.com or Allison at Law School Toolbox.com. Or you can always contact us via our website contact form at Law School Toolbox.com. Thanks for listening and we'll talk soon.